Hey everybody, thanks for joining me here today. This is Nicole with Topaz and today we are here to go over how to isolate your subjects with Topaz lens effects. There are several different ways to do this within lens effects from a very simple bokeh center focus effect to a more in-depth map creation where you actually go in, you paint the depth, varying depths into your image and then you play with it from there to a creative blur which looks very similar to a lens baby type of blur. So there are several different options that we're going to be covering today that will allow you to isolate your subject. And that's going to be an important thing for some images because when you isolate your image's subject with this selective focus that you're able to do, it really helps to direct the viewer's eye exactly where you want it to go, especially if you have a very busy background. So this is something that's quick or you can go a little bit more in depth. So we're going to be covering all the different ways to do that within lens effects. So with that, let's go ahead and just jump right on into some before and afters and then we'll get into lens effects and I'll show you some of the more, we'll start start out with the more simple ways and then work our way up to a more in-depth uh, way of creating this selective focus. So let me show you before and afters. Here's this before image and after. This image was taken into a just just to get a little bit more oomph in her eyes, but the rest of the toning and everything else, including the blurring of the background was in lens effects. So we will get into that. Before and after, here's before. And this image also was brought into Topaz Adjust before going into lens effects to open up the horse's shadows on the, his face. So here's where we started after Adjust. I was able to really open that up and then take it into lens effects and use the creative blur option. And that is a really interesting blur because it's not only a, a blur happening in the blurry area, but it also distorts the image in a really beautiful way. So it's that's why we call it creative blur. It can give you many different types of looks, but it really reminds me of what a lens baby can do as well. So we'll look at that and, and jump on into there. This is before and after. This image utilized the tilt shift camera filter within camera effect within lens effects. So again, there are so many different ways to be able to isolate your imagery, whether it's a certain focal point or a focal plane. This is a focal plane type of feature. Again, here's before and after. This treehouse uses the same tilt shift effect, trying to make this treehouse become a miniature treehouse. Oh, well, this is actually the creative blur. Let me show you that real quick. Here's before and after. Again, a little distortion happening, but in some images, it's really quite beautiful. This image, I actually went in and painted in the depth map to, to blur the background. So let's, here's before and after. Now we'll show you how to do that in the selective bokeh effect. This is the dual focus effect. Here's before. You can actually go in and select two points in your image to put the focal, uh, the focus on and you can have it be blurry in between those two points. So two separate points on your image. Again, it's called dual focus. This uses the very simple center focus bokeh effect. Here's before and after. We'll take this particular image in first. It's one of my favorites. This also uses the center focus effect. Here's before, and it's just around the edges and after. I believe that's it. So let's go ahead and jump on into the program with this kitten image to start off with. I'll get rid of these other layers and just take the original background layer, make a copy, and get into lens effects. Now, lens effects is so much more than just a selective focus or bokeh creator. <laughs> it, we have probably seven or eight different variations and ways that you can isolate your subject within lens effects, but if you'll notice, we have so many more things than that as well. We'll be jumping into a couple of them, but mainly focusing in on the actual isolation part. So, to create 
the after of the image that you saw, I actually used the Boca Center Focus. Before I get into that, let me just do a really quick brief intro to the interface in case you're not familiar. The preset panel is over here on the left. The preset preview is up top. The effects, all of the different effects that you can apply to your image are right here, and then the presets for those effects are down here. So let's say I'm in my fog. As I scroll over the fog, you'll notice up here in the preset preview, all those presets are shown up there. So if you find something you like, you can click on it, and it will apply to your image. Fog is not what we'll be talking about today, though. <laughs> you do have the ability to save, delete, import, and export your presets as well. You have your main viewer right here. Let's get to our toy camera. Okay. You do have the main viewer right here where you can go before and after on the upper left with these tabs. You can also take your left mouse button or your space bar and look at it before and after. And you can also look at it in a split screen mode over here on the top right. You just click on the split screen icon and it'll jump right on in there. Now I'm going to go back to my main screen. And then over on the right is where all of the adjustments are. So up here we have our preview navigator where you can actually scroll in and out uh, or zoom in and out, press fit and one to one. Right now they're grayed out because you can't do that with this particular effect. So let's go to one that you can, maybe filter single tone. Okay, so you can scroll in and out using these buttons. You can also move it around. Very simple stuff. You can undo and redo, and we have our snap feature in this program as well. Now this program is a little bit different than the rest of ours. The rest of ours have a set adjustment panel over on the right side, which never changes. We might have effects that are broken down into collections, such as black and white effects and adjust, and then presets at the bottom, but the actual adjustment panel doesn't change. In lens effects, it does, So because there's so many different things within this program. So what the things that you're going to need when you're in your single tone filter, such as the color tone adjustments and then the image adjustments, you're not going to necessarily need when you're in your reflector effect. So you will see these options, sliders, and tabs change with each effect that you choose. You can reset all down here, and then because we have so many different things going on within this program, you can apply. If you change where you are in your effects panel before you apply, you'll lose your work. So that's why that apply button is there. So let me show you in this workflow exactly why that apply button is important. Again, we are going to do a very simple center focus bokeh effect to start off with. This is the most simple one that we do have, I think, and I think it works very well. We do have some presets over here for the actual type of blur, whether it is a little hint of blur, barely there. Here we have really strong blur. So you can choose these presets based on just the blur effects and just don't look at where the point is. The point is in the middle for the entire thing and you can change that when you go over to your adjustment panel. I'm going to choose this happy medium preset for the blur. I kind of like that and I can work with it a little bit more in my bokeh adjustments. Over here on the right in my bokeh adjustments I have an effect center button. Very simple idea. Just click on the effect center and click on your image exactly where you want the center point to be. Now by default, let me take this transition slider down so you really see this blur line here. It's going to be directly in the middle. So you can see that right there, this oval shape. Now if I click, let's say right here between my kitten's eye and ear, you'll see that that jumped a little to the right and now the center point is right here and it's going to stay right there until we change that effect center again. So very simple stuff. Now we just play with our blur and the transition and how high or wide it is. So I'm going to take my focus width down. That was too far. <laughs> and I'm also going to take my focus height down. Get really a lot of, really into my focal point. I only want a little bit of focus in this particular image. And now that I have my area that I want sort of in focus, I'm going to take my transition slider and just make that a much more natural transition. And then I can change my blur amount if I want to make it more blurry or less blurry. I think I'm going to go just a tiny bit less. Okay, so maybe actually I'll take that up again. 
I like it a little bit more. Okay, so here's before, here's after. Very simple stuff, and that's really the most simple workflow we have for isolating your subject. Now, we do have something called lens characteristics in this particular effect. If you open that up, what that's going to give you are some lens characteristics that you would actually find in a camera lens. Basically, lens effects as a program is simulating lenses and filters that are traditionally used, that are actual physical objects that a lot of photographers use. However, a lot of us can't afford all of it, or we don't have all of it, or we don't have a need for all of this equipment and all of these different filters. So that's really what this is trying to provide you, is some real world effects that you can apply to your images. So when you open the lens characteristics, you'll see things like aperture shape, and you have many different shapes that you can choose here. And that's going to be really important whenever you are working with the creamy slider. As you take this down, you'll start to see the shapes showing up in the blur because it's a harsher blur. And you'll start to see these really beautiful shapes in some images. On this one, it doesn't look great, but here are the shapes and you can kind of see them. Now, if I change my aperture shape to a three, it's going to change into little triangles everywhere. If I change it to a circle, it'll be more circular bokeh type of shape as well. So those are kind of the options you have in this particular lens characteristics menu. I like to take the creaminess slider a little bit higher to get a smoother blur for this image. You can then work with your highlight boost, your highlight threshold, and you can add a little chromatic aberration for uh, effect if you'd like to. All right, so I am going to apply now because although I'm happy with my center focus isolation that we did, I still want to continue to work on the image. So I'm just going to say apply. The only thing I really want to do with this image is add a little bit of tone. And one of my favorite places to go find tone that's more creative and moody, because that's what I was originally wanting for this image, is this toy camera effect. Now, this isn't really a way to isolate an image, but if you have lens effects, come in here and just play around. And yes, it has this kind of camera shake effect on many of the effects. However, you can easily take that out and work with that later. So I like this Memories preset. That's a new one in the latest update. But I like the Soft and Dreamy, too. That's one of my favorites. So I don't want the camera shake. All I'm going to do is come into my toy camera, Aberrations, take my camera shake out, and now I've toned my image, and it's that simple. So that is how I got the after image for this particular kitten. So I'm going to say OK and let's move on to a little bit different process. I think I'm going to go to my horse image. Now here's the before image. I've already taken this into Topaz Adjust to open up my horse's face. It's not exactly the same as my after image before, but I just went in and did a quick preset and I'm pretty happy with it for demonstration purposes. It really just opened up the horse's face and added a lot of color and a little bit of oomph to the background. So for this particular image, I want to use the creative blur to isolate my horse a little bit more. I'll take this adjust layer into lens effects now. And the creative blur is probably one of my favorite ways to work with the selective focus because it's just so simple. So lens creative blur, you just scroll down to that effect. Now we do have some presets here for you, but honestly you're going to need to, unless this just falls directly on your subject, which many times it really won't. It'll just be a little bit off like this. Every time I've found I have to come over into my adjustments. So I just click that open. We have this effect center button again. This is a recurring theme <laughs> for these types of effects that have to have a focal point. These little buttons are all throughout the program. So if you see that, you know it's going to be a pretty simple process. You have the effect center. I'm just going to click on my horse's jaw there. We'll see what that looks like. Okay. Now, one thing I like to do whenever I'm working with blur and I can't really see the lines, the transition line very well, I like to take my blur amount really, really high. 
so I can really see the focal point and I can really understand what is really in focus because it's a little bit difficult sometimes. Now I can come in and work with my focus width and focus height and really see what's going on. So that's what I suggest with this particular one. But look at this, three sliders, that's it, to make a pretty cool image coming up. So now that I have something that I really enjoy here, at least for the focal point, I'm going to take my blur mount down, even a little bit farther down. Maybe something like that. So that quickly we were able to go from here to here. Really draw the viewer's eye into exactly where you wanted it to go. Not the foreground, not the colorful background. You were able to pinpoint this and make a really beautiful, that blur, I just love how it distorts um, everything just a little bit. It stretches everything. Again, before and after. Let's say OK, because it really was that easy. Now we're going to kind of move into a little bit more complicated, but still simple ideas of how to isolate the image. The first is going to be, let's take a look at the tilt shift. One of my favorites. OK, I'm going to get rid of these two layers here. And the tilt shift, instead of actually trying to isolate a focal point, it's going to isolate a focal plane. So it's going to be stretched across your image at some sort of angle, horizontal, vertical, but it's a focal plane type of isolation as opposed to a point. So let's see what we can do. All right, so here in the camera effects, we have tilt shift, I'll just press on that. And you'll have the default or whatever you worked on last come up. And you can tell right away that there is a line of focus that's going across the image diagonally. And that is the focal plane that I was speaking of. Now we just need to work with it a little bit for this particular image. My goal is to isolate this bench more so than this bench and just have a really um, nice image where I, I take the background and blur that out and, and really focused on the seat itself. So I'm going to, because I know I want a horizontal band, I'm going to click on the preset horizontal band lower half and see what happens. Okay, so here's my horizontal band. It's definitely hitting exactly where I want it to on the bench, but it's not looking very good right now, so we have to make a few adjustments. So let's hop on into the tilt shift adjustments first. Here we have the effect position button again. So if this really doesn't work for you, if you want to put it a little bit higher or farther down on this bench, just click there and it'll jump and there's your effect plane going across. You have the angle, 180 is going to be horizontal, 90 of course will be vertical and 0, 180, so that's simple to understand. Then you have your transition and blur amount and the focus area width. I'm sorry, let's start with that. Focus area width as you take this up or down will, as it suggests, change that focal plane width. And then you can come in and change your transition, make it a little bit more natural of a transition or a little bit more harsh, whatever the image and whatever your mood calls for. And then you have your blur amount. The blur amount is going to take down the blur or make it much more blurry. So again, this is something that is to taste for whoever's working on the image, but I think that's looking pretty good personally. Here's before and here's after. Then you have your image adjustments, which is nice in this particular category because tilt shift lenses and cameras are used a lot to create model types of images where it makes the scene that you're looking at look miniature so kind of like a miniature toy model scenes and usually to help create that illusion that it is a model or miniature scene you'll need to increase the brightness the contrast and the saturation because those color those models and those miniature scenes have a lot of saturated color and a lot of brightness it's not the normal day-to-day -day stuff so this is why your image adjustments are located here then you also have distortion adjustments. This is because one of the other main reasons that people use tilt shift lenses and cameras is architecture photography. When you are shooting something 
lines start to converge and distortion starts to happen with a normal lens. Uh, tilt shift can help to correct that distortion, that natural distortion of those converging lines. So we do have that in here as well. But as far as the blur itself goes to isolate your subject, all of that is going to be found in the tilt shift adjustments tab. So I hope you play around with that one. You can uh, have a lot of interesting, your images that might not be very interesting all of a sudden become interesting because you're focusing in on one point on your image. The tilt shift look I just love. Let me cancel or I'll say okay. The great thing about lens effects is with all the presets it's very simple to just go in, quickly find something and completely transform your image and that's something that I love. Now let's look at, before we go into this image, let's take a look at the dual focus. I'm going to get rid of all of these images. Start out with our beginning. The actual image itself is not great at this point. I haven't done any processing to it, but you'll get the idea because this is a great example for this dual focus feature. So the dual focus is going to be in the lenses because it is an actual lens that you can purchase. With the dual focus, we do not have any presets because that would be really difficult <laughs> to try to imagine where people would want their focal points. So you just come over to your adjustment panel and you have dual focus adjustments. The dual focus adjustments is going to contain this next focus point button. So you just click the next focus point button Put your focus where you think you want it, right about here for the first one. I'm going to say next focus point again, click on that again, put my second focal point maybe about right there, and then take my blur amount up, see what happened. Okay, so as I take my blur amount up, you see that this area where I chose on their faces is not blurring. Now we have to go in and actually change the size of those areas, but it's that simple. You just press next focal point twice and you're good to go. And you have this transition slider as well. This is a great way of isolating scenic shots and when you really want to take the background between two subjects and blur that, but you don't want to necessarily go in and painstakingly paint all of these different depths into the image like we're going to do here in a second. You just want to do something very quick. This is a great option. So I would then go into my focus area one size, which I know it's going to be her, I believe. So now I'm going to take my focus width one up. Oh, it's actually my dog. Just kidding. Okay, so now I've changed that a little bit. And I can go into my focus area size two, change that a little bit and get her whole face in focus. I'm going back to my dog too. <laughs> and so now I've gone from this original image to a dual focus look. So that is one of the other ways to isolate your subjects within lens effects. Let's go ahead and move on to what is an amazing tool. If you want to create a true depth of field type of image, then this next option would probably be really good for you. So let's, before we go into this one, actually I'll do this one first because I think this is a better example of all the different options and I can show you quickly how everything is done. So let's get rid of this top. I'll show you again what the before and after is. Here's before, here's after. Now this it's actually, and I'm just remembering, this is also an adjust. I just took it into adjust and did a little photo pop preset on it to open up his face a little. Here's before and here's after. Again, before and after. So we're going to take this adjust layer into lens effects. So I believe we've gone over the majority of how to quickly isolate your subjects within lens effects in several different ways, very creative ways with that creative blur, that dual focus. Now we're going to look at the more advanced way to isolate your images. That is going to be the Bokeh SLR lens and the Bokeh Selective. I'm not really going to look at the SLR lens here today. We're just going to look at the Selective, but it's basically the exact same thing that we're going to be going over, this Edit Depth Map 
technology is what I'm going to be focusing on. The great thing about the Boca SLR lens effects is that you have all of these presets where you can replicate blur from certain lenses. So you can replicate what, um, for example, a Canon 50mm f1.8 would produce. So that's the great thing about that. But in Boca Selective, I'm going to say Reset All. We have all of the same options in much more, so that's why I want to kind of focus in on this one. We just don't have the SLR presets. So the first thing that you're going to do, you're just going to walk through this six workflow step. When you click on Edit Depth Map, what's going to happen is a mass is going to show up on the right. So you can work on your original image or the mask, but I tend to work on my original image and just have this mask open to kind of see what's going on. Basically, and I go into this in much more depth too in other webinars, but I definitely wanted to cover it because I think this is one of the best things within lens effects. But if you are unfamiliar with it, we do have these little uh, directions up here. That's a brief intro to how to use all of these tools and what, what's really going on here. But basically what we're doing is we're painting in depth. We're using the values 0 to 255, the traditional tone values, to tell the program what is closest to the image and what is farthest away, or what is closest to the camera and what is farthest away. So you can use from 0 to 255, you don't have to use all the way from 0 to 255, you can t change that and use just gray to gray, but we're going to be using all the way from 0 to 255 today. 0 is going to be the closest to you, 0 is also black, so anything black in the image, the program is going to recognize that as your foreground or as your subject, what is closest to the camera. The 255 is the farthest, what's farthest away from the camera. And so that's kind of basically how this works. Many times when you click on Edit Depth Map and this mask arrives, it looks beautiful. It's perfect. It, everything looks the way it should, and you don't have to do anything. Not the case for this image. If you think about white being the farthest thing away from the camera, this is not correct. I'd say the farthest thing away is the sky. You know, this is something that is closer to the camera than these mountains all the way back here, this mountain range, which is colored gray. Well, white is supposed to be farther away than a mid-tone gray is supposed to be. So we're just going to restart from the beginning on this image and work all of these tools real quick. So all I'm going to do here is press reset. It's going to reset to the value of wherever my depth value slider is at. Right now it's at zero, which is a black. So when I press reset, I get a black screen. If I press reset, for example, when I was in a mid-tone gray, then I would get a mid-tone gray. Really doesn't matter, I don't find. <laughs> Unless the majority of your image needs a white color, then maybe you want to reset it white. Now we have this depth value near to far again near being 0, far being 255, and you can just paint on your image. You can paint on the image or on the mask itself, and it's going to start just filling in kind of content aware for you. So that's how this brush works. You're going to have to paint all of these different values in, and sometimes it's kind of a pain, especially if you have an image like this where you don't necessarily need to do that. We only have one main subject. Everything else in the area is basically a gradient from near to far, so that's why we have our gradient brush available for you. So when you click check on use gradient brush, you have the ability to use this gradient brush, and that's what we're going to do here today. Basically the values are the exact same, 0 being near, 255 being far, and you have a starting value and an ending value, and I do want to start at 0 and end at 255, so that's what I'm going to do. And then you have your brush size. The brush size needs to be, for gradients on large images, needs to be kind of high. I'd say anywhere from 128 to 192 is the best. Unless you're working on a really large image, then you can use 255. So all you do is Start, see I have these, uh, this crosshair and I'm going to be working on the image to the left, the actual image. And I'm just going to start in the bottom left corner. I'm going to click and drag to where I want my gradient to start and end. I want it to start in the foreground, end in the mountain range, and 
voila, I unclick and a gradient is starting to show. So I'm just going to do several different strokes here and it's going to just blend together. Now it looks like I need to maybe go up in my size for this image. Let's see. Sometimes when the gradient does this and it doesn't blend too well together, it's because of your brush size. And that's one of the things that people say about this particular thing. And that's, so that's a really good tool tip with this particular tool tip to try different brush sizes if it's not blending very well. Okay, I'm just doing a couple more here and I'm pretty happy with it so far. All right, so we're going to stop right there and now focus on the sky and our subject. So now that we have this gradient for the, the actual landscape, I'm now just going to take my entire sky and make it white because that is the color I need it to be. So I'm going to uncheck the Use Gradient Brush and get back to our regular brush. Go to 255 and take my brush size up pretty high because it's a big old sky. And I'm just going to click a few times. And as I click, around my subject, you'll notice that it's pretty easy for the program to recognize that that's not part of the sky, so it will cut him out sort of um, within, and, and you can usually at least see him much better or see your subject much better, so that's why I enjoy that process. Now I'm going to take him in, at a depth value of zero. I want him to be close, or he is close. So I'm just going to take my brush size down, come over to over here, and just start painting on his body. And it'll just kind of naturally fill in to the edges. So it's much easier when it kind of does it on its own. Now you could sit here for a while and be very, very, very exact. But I don't think we're going to do that today. I'm just going to kind of get the majority here. All right, so now that we have the majority of him black, I'm going to go back and I'm going to touch up around where he that started to go into the edges of the sky. The reason it did start to bleed is because we didn't actually paint the sky white right here. We just let it kind of do it itself. So now when I paint the sky white, it will fill in to those edges. So pretty simple. Now this again is when you're trying to simulate true depth of field, what a lens would do for you. I'm going to come in to my image and get these little spokes in between these spokes. And it should just kind of fill in. There we are. Not bad. Okay, and I'm going to do it right here as well. Okay, and I'm pretty happy with that. Again, I could sit here and I could touch up for a while, but I'm not going to at this point. I do want to show you one feature, though, and that is the eyedropper feature. When you click on the eyedropper, you can then, once you've made your gradient, you can click at the bottom of something to find out what depth it should be. So this tree is a little bit wider than I think it should be. It's actually matching the same tone as the background mountain range. So we don't want that. So what I did is I just clicked on this eyedropper and I'm coming over here to the left of my tree and I'm just clicking near the bottom to get a tone. The tone jumped to 184 so now I know that's what I'm supposed to be painting this tree at. And I'm just going to come in and make a few lines and it's going to naturally just kind of fill in which is something that I just love about this program because it's very difficult to have to go in and try to paint a tree. <laughs> so that little content aware is pretty nice. Okay, let's try to get the rest of this tree. Okay, that'll work for now. So there we are. Pretty happy with that and I'm going to now go to the fun part of this program. And that is when you go to focal plane positioning. I'm going to go to my main screen again. The focal plane position is where you get to select your focal plane now, and that's the fun part. So I'm going to select my focal plane by clicking the button and clicking on his face. You'll notice that it stayed at zero, or actually it's at one, which is very close to zero, and I'm actually going to take that to zero because I know he's black. And now I'm going to take my background blur amount up, 
And as you can see, everything that was in that one or zero area, that black, so our foreground here and him, they're all in focus. As I take my focal plane position slider and take that somewhere else, let me take my foreground blur up. When I take my focal plane position to 255, which is white, my background is now in focus and my foreground, which is that black color, is very out of focus. So this is how you create a very realistic simulation of a camera and, and depth of field and being able to really control that. And you can control it with that focal plane adjustments. And then you also have a depth of field where you can uh, take your depth of field and increase it or decrease it. And I'm going to increase it for this one. I'm going to take my background blur down just a little pretty happy with that. Then we have the lens characteristics. Now we've already gone over the lens characteristics in another so I'm not going to do that. I am just going to take my creamy slider up and then move on to the focus area adjustments which I love because here you have the ability to sharpen, you can change the brightness, contrast, and saturation of just your focal area, not anything else. So you can really have your subject stand out even more by just increasing the brightness, contrast, or saturation, maybe sharpen just a little bit. And then going into your blur area adjustments and maybe taking down the brightness of that blur area, maybe taking down the contrast or the saturation. And I actually want to keep my contrast a little bit higher. There we go. So those are just some options for you for adjustments specific to your blurred area versus your focus area. Then you have a vignette and grain in here as well, which many lenses will help you create a sort of vignette. And I do want a little bit of a vignette on this image. I'm just going to take my vignette strength up, start to see a vignette coming. Take my size up because it's a little, little much. And I'm going to add some grain and then take my grain out because I don't really want it. <laughs> But here's where we were before, here's where we are after. He's a little too bright, that focus area, so I'm just going to take that down. But you get the idea. This is how we add and create depth of field. Here's before and after. We say OK. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you guys. Those are the, I believe it was six different ways of isolating your subjects within lens effects. You have all of those different choices, more simple, a little bit more realistic, a little bit more creative, several ways that you can go with this particular program. Let's see here. Oh, Janelle, great question. She says, can you save your depth maps? Absolutely. Now this is a program that I have a feeling that depth maps are going to be some of the questions. So I'm going to take this. This is the adjusted image. Here's the original. And then I did take it into adjust to get some oomph in the eyes again and just kind of make that exposure a little bit better. So I'm going to take that particular one in to show you how to save your depth map. All right, so all you have to do to save your depth map once you've gone through everything, because you do lose it once you get out of the program if you don't save it. So if you've worked painstakingly hard on creating a very realistic depth map, on a really complicated image <laughs> and then you lose it, you know, you spend 20 minutes on it and then you lose it. It's going to be frustrating if you have to take that picture back into lens effects and you want to change the focus just a little bit. It's much easier if you just save it. So you just save it by going to menu and save mask. And so you can save this mask and then the next time you bring this image in, you can then load the mask as well. One thing to note, Janelle, is the image and mask have to be the same dimensions. Otherwise, they won't come in. The mask will not get imported into the session unless it's the same dimension as the image, the original image that you're working with. Rachel asks, what does chromatic aberration do? Let's see if it works for this image. I bet it will, especially along the horizon of the trees. So we're back to the selective. I'm going to say reset all and go to edit depth map. Now, just to make this really quick, I will
do a couple quick things here. Okay, that'll be good enough for the presentation or of, of the chromatic aberration. So let's get some blur going. <laughs> that would be helpful. We'll put the select focal plane on our girl here. Depth of field, sure. Background blur amount. We'll go to our lens characteristics and we'll put some chromatic aberration in there. Now keep an eye out the aperture shape and then you'll notice all of the different kind of halos that are happening. Now chromatic aberration is something that some people are not a fan of and it's a flaw in some cameras, in some lenses, but it's also something that's going to make your images look a little bit more realistic. And that was the idea to, again, have a very realistic set of tools that lenses in all of the, even if it's something that some people consider a problem, the chromatic aberration. Now, one other thing that the chromatic aberration slider will do is help to correct some chromatic aberration from other lenses. So let's say you have a warm aberration. Now, I, I hope you guys can see over here, let me show you one more time, keep an eye on the trees because that's where you really see it in this particular image. This is warm and now we're going to cool. Lorna says, can you demonstrate using the blur on some background trees? Sure, Lorna, this is an image where um, I guess this has the background trees. Now we didn't really go through this like we should have, so if you want me to go through that, I can. Let me press reset all. Go back up to the edit depth map. And here's what it originally came up with. Let me go to the zero and since we're in the question and answer portions, I don't want to sit here and do this exactly, so I'll just do a few. There we go. And this works sometimes for adding realistic depth of field as well. It's a little bit more simple of a way of doing things, just clicking on a few of the default depths and just working with them that way. And here I'm just clicking along the tree line and you'll see that it's just filling out very naturally and it knows where those edges are. Again, something I love. Sometimes you're going to need to go in and work with it a little bit more, but it does a pretty good job. Let's get this little guy. Okay, let's just get that one. Okay, and now I'm going to make her black. And again, I'm just doing this very quickly. I would take much more time and much more care uh, I did in the um, example images as well, which you guys did see. Okay, so now that we have that, I'm going to go into my focal plane adjustments and I'm going to take my background amount up and select my focal plane again on her. And now I can play with my depth of field. Now here, you know, it does not look necessarily realistic because the background is so blurry. So as you take that down, you'll see those trees start to come back in a little bit. All right, everybody, thanks again, and I will be seeing you soon. Have a great weekend and a great morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Take care.